well uh, good evening everyone and welcome to this panel discussion on dementia from hospital care to home care uh, this panel discussion is a very different one because it's one which is organized by the bombay psychiatric society and uh, for the first time on our panelists we have refrained from having a psychiatrist because we said we would listen to all the non psychiatrists and their views on uh, home based care and other aspects of dementia uh, well i am your moderator for the evening dr binash to souza i am the current president of bombay psychiatric society i am very thankful to my uh, all members of the executive council including dr sheril dr priyanka and the others who have joined us so uh, i will start by uh, introducing our panelists for the evening Uh, our first panelist is Dr. Prem Narasimhan, who is currently the chief consultant in geriatric medicine and elder care specialist, and the founder of the Department of Geriatric Medicine at Jaslok Hospital. Uh, sir has been, of course, presenting on many international platforms and uh, uh, places on geriatric care, and of course. Uh, so he has published many books and papers in that regard and he's also done an advanced course in geriatric oncology and palliative care so we're very happy to have you here dr prem uh, our our second panelist for the evening is dr smita desai dr smita desai is a psychologist special educator and founder director of drishti we all know her in bombay psychiatric society for her work done in the field of learning disability but the reason she is here is because she is naturally balanced the ebb and flow of life in the art of caregiving for her octogenarian father in law who lives with dementia and with her forte in applied psychology and behavioral disorder she has worked in leadership education creating awareness and of course has been as a consultant for various boards various government organizations non government organizations so i am very thankful to smith for to smita ma'am for joining us here today good evening ma'am uh are uh third panelist is dr odette gomes again not someone who is not unknown to people in the city of mumbai madam gomes has been the professor and head of the occupational therapy school at the nair hospital uh, she uh, has of course worked with students at an undergraduate postgraduate and a phd level she's been mentoring autists in the field of ergonomics people for parkinsons as well as dementia she's always been interested in geriatric care and geriatric neurology and geriatric palliative care and of course her her major um, expertise also is also on programs with regarding to healthy aging and wellness uh, i of course personally have fond memories of knowing her since my younger days because of her association even with my dad at that time so ma'am thank you so much for uh, joining us here today uh, our fourth panelist is all the way from delhi we have dr mala shankar das kapoor shankar das who's a nationally internationally well known sociologist gerontologist and health social scientist who's based in india she has uh, been the former a former professor at the university of delhi where she retired from in march 2021 she has of course written 10 books on the subjects including an international handbook on elder abuse which i have gone through and it's a very well written book apart from that she's been on who unfpa undc programs she's been consulting for the united nations and uh, the asian representative to the international network for the prevention of elder abuse she's also been a resource person on various national international conferences and various international fellowships on aging issues so thank you so much ma'am uh, for joining us here today evening and our last panelist of course is uh, mrs vidya shanoy and mrs vidya shanoy is an integrative dementia care specialist she has been working in running her own day care center in the city of mumbai called smriti vishwam which works with dementia patients she is also the national secretary of the alzheimers related disorders society of india and heads the alzheimers related disorders society of india mumbai chapter where i work as a treasurer with her and well this whole month she has been active conducting a huge amount of dementia awareness program sometimes even three or four times a day courtesy the online availability which has made it a lot easier and has been reaching out to various sections of society including the government non government organizations and at a private level so we're very thankful to have you here i will start straight with you dr prem and my first question to you is that uh, you know a very simple question you know what are the benefits of home care in in dementia 
Uh, first of all, thanks a lot uh, for inviting me from the Bombay Psychiatric Society, and it's it's really great to be on this panel. I mean, a lot of familiar faces uh, with whom I have worked actually earlier as well in Delhi as well. Uh, so I think home care in general is something which is always an absolute necessity as far as elder care is concerned. Now, home care in dementia, I think even more so. Now, how much of a person who actually has a a cognitive impairment is what I would say. And then diagnosing into a full-blown dementia is going to be very comfortable in the hospital. I think it's something which is uh, with experience, even, even so, and in clinical practice, and also seeing a lot maybe even in family and friends, it doesn't really turn out really well. That's where the importance of home care and dementia. And yes, however, the home care in dementia also has its challenges. Uh, I think the caregiver, now we are talking about the primary caregiver, has a huge responsibility in which they have to take care. We have to take care of caregiver stress as well. Another point is how good the professional caregiver is who actually might have to come in because ultimately the primary caregiver will not be able to take care of maybe a full-blown dementia with maybe a behavioral and psychological disorders, which might actually happen uh, much later in severe dementia. So the challenges really increase, but I think home care is a, an absolute necessity. And I think the basic motto of geriatrics has always been, if you are not able to cater to a person at a particular place, you need to reach them. So I think geriatrics is not about hospital care. Geriatrics is not about OPD, IPD. Geriatrics is usually about reaching out either into the community or in this case, as you said, home. And whatever maximum can be done at home should be done. Uh, we all know that dementia is something which is not entirely curable, but the diagnosis and at what level are we seeing that particular person? And this is not only medically, I feel, uh, even non-pharmacological interventions like art therapy, music therapy go hand in hand these days. Earlier, dementia maybe was a death sentence. It no longer is. And home might be the best place for an older adult to actually do all these things uh, in which uh, the overall holistic way can be seen and we can e take care of that older person, the person with dementia rather than the diagnosis of dementia, which can usually happen in a hospital. Right. Well, uh, uh, moving to uh, Madam uh, Smita Desai, well, ma'am, being a caregiver yourself, I mean, uh, uh, what are some of the advantages and challenges that you know you have faced in home care of someone very close to you? Yeah. yeah. First of all, thank you, Abhinash. Thank you, Vidya, for inviting me. And a very good evening to all the other panelists as well as the guests for the evening. Um, so I think, Abhinash, we, um, you know, you have been quite familiar with, um, you know, with, my caregiving and uh, not just my the entire family caregiving because um, we I think have been very lucky to be able to reach out to you every now and then in helping us provide care right so I would say um, one of the biggest benefits you know of um, caregiving at home is that you know there's there's this kind of a collectivist approach it feels like the entire family is you know now probably taking care of a person who really needs it and i think more than anything at least i can speak for myself i feel like i'm giving back to this person who you know did a lot for me when i entered into this family right so i have a great um, you know connection with my father-in-law um, he was almost like a mentor to me when I entered into the family mentor, even at work. And so for me, it was almost like I was giving back. And um, I think the benefit is also for, I must say, I'm not, I don't consider myself to be a primary caregiver. Primary caregiver has been the spouse. And of course, now we've managed to, you know, get a full-time care. So of course, the, you know, spouse has you know, it's been allowed to, you know, has been allowed to step back a little bit because we could see a lot of other psychological morbidities with her in terms of anxiety, depression, etc. And so that's what leads to the challenges. And the challenges is, 
you know, the initial challenges were much greater, Avinash, where there were a lot of behavioral issues, behavioral disorders, um, you know, um, toileting, changing clothes, bathing, just the daily care posed, I think, the biggest challenges. Um, and I think the other challenge, let's say, for my husband and me, my husband, who's the son, um, was also taking care of, you know, my, uh, of the spouse, that my, my, that's my mother-in-law, because she, you know, the spouse, spousal caregiver is almost like the invisible second patient, right? So, you know, there was a lot of care that had to go into, you know, uh, looking after her mental health and well-being. So I think those have been the challenges, kind of, you know, putting it, uh, putting it very briefly. And I think one of the biggest challenges that we do face as a family is that there isn't really very good trained, you know, kind of personnel whom we can get at home, um, you know, to kind of help the primary caregivers. Right. Well, uh, I uh, now move to Madam Odette Gomes. And uh, my, my query to you is that very often uh, during the home care of dementia, I mean, there are a lot of internal minor major modifications that you know we have to make to the house to suit the dementia patient from uh, a dementia perspective so as an occupational therapist i mean what is the advice that you give to say relatives who are looking at home care you know for a patient with dementia good evening and thank you dr avinash and vidya it, it is really lovely to be part of such an esteemed panel and to have all these guests uh, attending in such large numbers too. Yes, it is It is absolutely essential uh, to address the caregiver's woes as to how to deal with the person. You know, so we as OTs look at the person as a whole. And when you are dealing with the caregiver, you look at the physical environment which is there for a person. Now, if he's in the mild cognitive stage or whether he's in the middle of the dementia stage, you make modifications within the home, within the toilets. You have these cues that you can help and give them proper lighting areas. You give cues, you give cues even to the caregiver. Ergonomic cues, how you can transfer without hurting your back, how you can make things easier in the toilet. You know, when they reach a kind of mid stage and late stage, their senses, the vision, hearing, and touch, especially. There's so much of confusion, the perception goes. So when we look at water, water is transparent. They don't get a feedback as to what is water and the touch of water scares them. So when you are taking them for a bath, there is a lot of anxiety because they don't understand what the water is. They don't understand that you are trying to undress them because there's certain social graces still persi uh, persistent when they are there so you need to use different terminologies like maybe if it's a lady you say oh come on we're going for our spa and you know you start putting water only on the feet first and then go a little higher and check the temperature with them so there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one that the caregiver needs to do to handle with the patient you also have a lot of these making the environment in the home dementia friendly you know, have, when you're in the earlier stages, you have a big clock with nice big numbers, not just the dashes. You have cues, you have a date, with the day and time, uh, day and date of the year. You have signs on the board. You, you declutter the place, you know, so there is no confusion for their perception as to what they're doing. If you want them to wear certain clothes, just put that outfit in front so they know what they have to do and not let them go into a cupboard full of plates and stuff. Even when eating, as an artist, we deal with the activities of daily living. Like Smita Madam says, you know, dressing yourself and you need to let them do as much as they can do till they can do. You know, functional independence. Because every person, our OT philosophy with the elder person, is occupation is fundamental to health and well-being. So you can't just treat them as... Uh, sorry to say like a furniture and say you know i am doing everything for you you don't worry no let them do they've lived all their lives so let them do as much as they can do with a little bit of assistance from you make the timing table such that there is a self-colored tablecloth even the plate should be self-colored then we can understand the food in the plate 
and encourage them. If they don't know how to eat, you sit at their side and they will imitate you. You may not understand, but they will imitate you and do. You know, so certain cues, tips and tricks and strategies for the caregiver within the home is something that we can always uh, advise and help in, in the area. Right. Uh, before I come to you, Mala, Madam, I'll go to Vidya first. And uh, well, uh, Madam, you have been running a daycare center in the city of Mumbai. Now, very often a daycare center is uh, someone is a place where, you know, people keep their patient for the day and take them back. And this very often does happen because we have small homes in Bombay and, you know, it gets difficult to manage the patient at home. Now, my whole thing is as a daycare center, I mean, uh, what do you all do to sort of, you know, make the patient, because I've seen, I've been there and I've seen most of your patients are very happy in your daycare center. So what do you all do to make them feel at home over there? Okay, firstly, I have to say thank you to all of the panelists who agreed to be there on the program. And it's one of the most fantastic mixes that we have. Um, coming back to the question, first, the second thing I'd like to say is, we are always looking at people who are affected or living with Alzheimer's. We rarely think of the person who's caring. So normally the love is given to the person with Alzheimer's, but the family carer or the hired caregiver, a trained caregiver is, uh, you know, taken for granted, let me say. Uh, daycare facilities are very, very important because they need some breathing uh, space. They need their me time to themselves. And the best way is to have the persons come to the center. Now, when we set up the center called Universe of Memory, Smriti Vishwam, the idea was not to have it as a commercial uh, base. We thought of the people who would have to, uh, who would need that time for themselves. At the same time, they wanted to ensure that the persons with dementia are well looked after. So it is more of a uh, person-centered project for me. I thought it was important to be sensitive to the person's coming, presuming that they could have been my own parents or my family member or some friends who we've grown up with. So what do we do there? I think non-pharmac interventions are very, very important because the medicines do their job and the other therapists are making it, you know, they're trying their best to um, be inclusive in a multidisciplinary team. So nothing goes singular handed. So here we have a team who puts in things together and you know, we are giving them all what they would have had had they not been affected by dementia. So you know, when they come for a registration, we'll ask 50,000 questions to the irritation of the family who's brought the member. But for us, that is our main a masala for the cooking, you know, to make a customized program. And then what we do is knowing their past history, what their interests were, how they manage their lifestyle earlier, we start planning. So it could be either music, art, dance, any kind of creative therapy and have a customized plan. You integrate all these uh, uh, therapies and see what the effect is. And at every different point of time, I think they in evolve or they improve or maybe they get irritated. So it's a continuously changing program that we acclimatize it to the person with dementia. So they don't get bored, they don't get nasty when they go back home. And as uh, Dr. Smita said that it's very important to have hired caregivers who are trained for which we do training programs. We have modules either, you know, it's a two day, five day, one month, two months, whatever. It's customized and we have trained caregivers. And of course, I mean, you know, we have celebrations of birthdays and we have public events. We've taken them, you know, I have to share this. Uh, one of the members, our family members said, yes, CCD kya hai? So I said, CCD mujhe bhi nahi khat pata hai. I said, kyo pooch rahe He said, my granddaughter, meri poti jo hai, wo har Friday ko jati hai. You know, instantly I said, come on called up the, uh, you know, the car services, hired two cars, took them straight to the CCD by Jove. I mean, we had made their week, forget the day. And they had such a good time. And it was fortunate that it was a morning. It was not their high 
peak time, you know, I mean, peak uh, business time. So when we are coming out, they say, Kal kitne baje aane ka idhar? that was one instant. Another instant was somebody said, oh, you know, when I used to go with my then girlfriend, we used to go to Kerustam for ice cream. We had the same thing done. We put the uh, apron so that they won't mess the clothes. And we went over there. I said, put it in half because I'm a diabetic. And that's what we did. So we kind of give them a time that they look forward to coming. And that's why instead of a five-day week, we made it a six-day because two of them had gone on a Saturday straight to the center thinking that it's open. So we are, you know, just no rules, go with their flow. There's no patshala discipline at all. Right. Well, uh, yeah, coming coming to you, Mala Madam, I know you want to share your thoughts with us. So I would, you know, request you uh, to probably plan your sharing in probably, you know, two or three slots of, you know, two, three or four minutes, if you can, you know, at a time so that we can run it as a panel as well. So uh, please, ma'am, you can, you know, share what you wanted to share with regard to home care and the psychosocial aspects. Please, please go ahead. You can unmute. You'll have to unmute yourself, ma'am. You'll have to unmute. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Pleased to be part of this webinar, which to my mind is covering very important theme relevant not only in the Indian context, but also globally. I congratulate both Vidya Shenoy and Dr. Avinash D'Souza for joining hands in organizing this extremely topical meeting. I will summarize on dimensions of home care by discussing the benefits of home care, not in practical terms as uh, that has been discussed by fellow panelists, but more on how we need to look at in-home services objectively as a means to care. I want to begin with stating that dementia has emerged as a serious problem and um, which has medical, social, and psychological dimensions. Cases of dementia are not only increasing, but fortunately, aware is being, awareness is being generated by the medical community, NGO sector, and researchers, though more of it is required to understand how to deal with the problem and develop appropriate services, which can cater to the needs of dementia-affected person as well as to those of the caregivers. In a developing country like India and also in many other nations where age-related facilities are limited, managing diagnostic treatment and caregiving aspects of dementia present many challenges. However, in some parts of the world, there have developed better responses to dementia and we can learn from these, their experiences. So as part of my presentation, I will focus on uh, the topic of home care, but uh, more in terms of in-home care, which includes a wide range of services provided in the home uh, rather than in a hospital or care community. Because I believe it can allow a person with Alzheimer's or other dementia to stay in his or her own home which is essential. It can also be of great assistance to caregivers who could be unpaid people from the family or paid workers hired from outside, maybe affiliated to a medical clinic, care organization or an institution. So uh, before I give it back to Avinash, I will just like to elaborate further on the home care services. First of all, let's be clear that not all in-home services are the same. Some in-home services provide non-medical help, such as assistance with daily living. Other in-home services involve medical care given by licensed health professional, such as a nurse or physical therapist. And we can group these services in different categories to have greater clarity. So I would like to share with you that there are those who, which are referred to as companion services, which involves help with supervision, recreational activities or visiting. Then there are personal care services, which is help with bathing, dressing, toileting, eating, exercising, or other personal care. 
Also, there are homemaker services which help with housekeeping, shopping, or meal preparation. And finally, there are skilled care services which help with wound care, injections, physical therapy, and other medical needs by a licensed health professional. Oftentimes, a home health care agency coordinates these types of skilled care services once they have been ordered by a physician. In some dementia centers and big hospitals in the country, these provisions are now gradually becoming available. Also, some dementia centers run by NGOs while providing care at their centers are facilitating availability of such services. So with regard to home care services uh, uh, mentioned, fortunately, certain organizations are now specializing in providing the facilities mainly as paid services. But as things stand due to increased awareness of the unique challenges that Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia present, reputable home care companies across the country are providing their employees with proper dementia care training. So experienced and informed professional caregivers can provide benefits to both seniors and their family members that make in-home care worth considering. But nonetheless, most of this works out expensive for the general public. And the challenge with the Indian government is to have a better and affordable reach out for them. It is however worth notice, noting that few NGOs involved with dementia care are uh, providing training for family caregivers on home services, which enable them to deal with the non-medical concerns on day-to-day -day basis. The financial cost here is only involved with that of tra taking training, but I would like to point out that this works out in the long run very costly if we take the social cost of it. The care burden is now being recognized all over the globe as a matter of concern, and we seriously need to minimize it. So it is pertinent that the focus should always be on taking into account quality of life aspects of those affected with dementia, whether as an individual patient or as a caregiver. So all of you attending this webinar would be realizing that in early stages of Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia, seniors frequently choose to remain in the comfort of a familiar home. And as limitations increase, uh, uh, and uh, 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 family caregivers get overwhelmed, then they turn to supportive services to help with the challenges that arise. So the biggest value that home care offers is that it allows seniors to remain in the home as long as possible. And this option is far less disorienting for a dementia patient then a move to assisted living facility, a memory care unit, or a nursing home. Familiar, familiar environments offer a great deal of security and peace of mind for individuals with dementia. So if a family decides to use professional trained uh, home health aids for dementia uh, patients, then in-home care can be the ideal starting point for families to reduce their own care burden and make use of extra help for their loved ones, as well as prevent or delay placement in a long-term care facility. Ma so ma I will we, we, stop we, here yeah, because yeah. Uh, this is just to give you that I promote and encourage uh, people to think of this option. Sure, ma'am. Right. Sure. Right, right. Well, uh, Dr. Prem, coming back to you, I mean, you know, very often you will agree that in clinical practice, uh, you know, we have seen where uh, times when dementia patients and the elderly have been in and out of hospitals also because of various reasons. And uh, so there's like a combined hospital home care model that we use. So, you know, what would be your views on this kind of a holistic care model? Please, please share that. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Dr. Vinash, because ultimately, yes, they... As, as we see, they are more susceptible to the common problems in an older person, especially things like infections. You are talking about UTI, you are talking about pneumonias, you are talking about electrolyte disturbances like hyponatremia. So, or, and 
to a great extent even low nutrition which 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 tends to get them to a phase where they might be susceptible to even more things so once that happens you have to have a model in which uh, yes a hospital as well as the home combined model has to be professed so in that case i think once the acute once the acute part situation has been allayed like for example is hyponatremia is there and it has been corrected i think we always need to think as a care team to look at a window uh, wherein we can continue care at home uh, rather than uh, con- rather than continuing care in the hospital purely because i think uh, depending upon how serious they are yes uh, hospital acquired infections can also uh, take a huge toll another important uh, aspect of course uh, here is to what extent the the caregiver thinks that that care can be replicated at home so that does not always happen but yeah of course nowadays there have been lot of uh, you can say organizations especially i mean lot of care has been provided even i mean icu at home uh, as sort of uh, very, very much profess in most cases so of course uh, it comes at a cost let us be very frank so we are talking about people who can afford it because icu at home will be a lot of monitoring and everything and again to substitute the same environment which as an older person in an icu would see for example just colors different colors older person with dementia is even worse so the 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 fact that delirium is something which obviously you must be knowing through clinical practices they are the most susceptible to that as well and that just clouds our even clinical judgment even more so i think we have to take that collective decision wherein the acute care should be done and at the same time the team should be involved now the team has to work over time uh, in trying to make sure that the nutrition is there wherein the dietitian will come in the physiotherapist will come in the at home i think the as dr odet said the occupational therapist should already have started working that these are the changes which will have to be made and ultimately a, a very good transition from that hospital to home should happen so that we can focus on whatever quality of life they can return back to we might not be able to change it completely but at least try to maintain right thank you so much well uh, moving on to uh, madam smita desai i mean um, how do you think i mean taking care of someone close to you like you're doing now you know has as a caregiver has changed you as a person and how has you know home care of such a person sort of you know enhanced your own life right so i think um, avinash is not just myself i think there is a complete change of the entire family it just not just doesn't impact one person and um, you know we live as an you know as a joint or an extended family so it's my father in law mother in law and four of us and um what you know so there are there are positives and then there are the challenges and you know there are the negative impacts also so i feel that how it has positively impacted uh, me and the rest of the family members is over a period of time okay not initially but over a period of time we have learned to be more accepting of you know actually actually a disability at home although i work in that field of disabilities but when it actually hits you at home it's a completely different metamorphosis that takes place and um so i feel that all of us have really evolved for the better uh, we've become more patient we've become more accepting uh, we are able to understand better when other people around us are actually going through all these things and i think it's been a real uh, life changer for my two young daughters you know who are now young women um and it um, you know again like i said it was almost a cycle of giving back and i can see that in them also my younger daughter very fortunately had also been an intern at the alzheimer's disease research center for stanford university and i think that really helped her when she came back home and she could really help all of us out so that's the very positive change that i think it has had for all of us negatively also it has impacted um avinash where and that negative impact now when i look back it's been a 5 to 6 year journey by now initially there was a lot of anger frustration conflicts um you know we 
we couldn't find ourselves planning adequately for what's going to come. So a lot of uncertainties in spite of, you know, both me and my husband working in the field of psychology. But then slowly we kind of calmed ourselves down and we, we started planning on different fronts. We started becoming, you know, we started planning for my father, you know, for my, for my in-laws, my parents, and then also for the rest of the family with respect to the caregiving, finances, legal aspects, and then also, uh, I think, mod, you know, modifying the environment, as Odette said, you know, modifying a lot of things that happen. And today, I can say we are in a much better space, Avinash, than we were five years ago. Uh, you're, you're on mute, Avinash. Moving on to Odette, ma'am. Well, um, what are the, you know, basic tips or skills you would advise, you know, as an occupational therapist to caregivers, particularly when, you know, you're looking after a patient with dementia and... Uh, uh, and also, I would, you know, want you to add a little on the fact that uh, we have this whole new paradigm of healthy aging, you know, as which is there. So, you know, what tips would you give caregivers in general, you know, looking after elderly parents? Okay, we can talk on healthy aging first. Okay, okay, sure. No problem. Uh, yeah. Like I said, you know, the core philosophy of OT when dealing with, uh, with respect to older persons is that occupation is fundamental to health and well-being. Why do I say that? All your working life, you hold some position in the office, some position of standard. Everybody's looking at you, asking you for your opinion. And suddenly after you retire, you're kind of in a limbo of sorts because now people consider you of no use to, to, uh, to coin a phrase. But it should be that. So when we deal with older adults, older persons, we have these three approaches. One is prevention, the preventive approach, which is like prevention is better than cure. One is the accommodative approach. And then, of course, the restorative approach. In prevention, as an OT, we said we use a trilogy of mind, body, and soul. So where the body is concerned, see that you are mobile. Use your legs. Walk. Because that is the area that... From where aging starts, the legs. We are more concerned about the neck to see how many gray hair we have or how many wrinkles we have, but it is the legs. And if you walk and you keep mobile, you will not be isolated at home. You are able to go out into society. Your legs hold your body. They are your pillars of the body. So they need to be strong. They will also in, uh, improve on your balance. So you have less falls. So there's false prevention. Less fractures so that you don't stay at home. Use good posture techniques, ergonomics, so you are well physically. Mentally, you must socialize. Socialize with people your age. Socialize with people younger than you. Because that's where you get your energy and information. Just try and keep up with what is going on around you. Use technology. Learn some basic technology. You can chat with your friends on WhatsApp. Learn to chat with your children who are abroad or your grandchildren. Able to attend sessions like this because you know how to get it on your phone. So you need to kind of keep up with time. Use your me time. Spend time on your hobbies, on your leisure activities. They're very good for the mind. Do all your crosswords and stuff like that to keep your cognition intact. And the, the spirit or the so, uh, emotion, of course, prayer is there. Music and dance, there's nothing uh, which is not touched upon where music and dance is concerned. All these kind of stimulate your happy hormones. It gives you a kind of balanced outlook to life. As an older person, try and have chats with young ones. You know, the neighbors are very happy to take the little ones away for an hour a week. Tell them stories. You either read from a book, so you're encouraging them to read, or you can tell them okay, what the toilet. You have your life stories, which are also interesting for them. And they will know what you did when you were a child. You can do the same with your grandchildren through Zoom, if they are not within the city. So you have to inculcate all these approaches for a healthy living. Now, when caregivers are concerned, we, have, we, we look at caring for the caregivers because the caregiver is sandwiched between the parent and the child.
Okay, I was muted. I said the caregiver is sandwiched. It's a sandwiched uh, person because you have the older adults whom you have to look after and you have your children whom you have to look after and as well work to bring in the money because without that, you cannot do so many things. So they need care. As OTs, we will do one thing is empower them. How do you empower them? You explain the illness to them. If they are dealing with somebody who's got dementia, explain what is memory, explain how much of attention is needed, explain that there is something called short-term memory and long-term memory. You, know, you don't have to go into the details of memory, but simple things so they know, They otherwise the, the, uh, the caregiver says, oh, he remembers this, that, but now I told him something and he doesn't remember. So they have to realize that that short-term memory loss is related to the illness. Without that, you teach them all these scripts, skills that you can use in the house in labeling things so that the patient knows. You can put a cross where the toilet door is. You can put, uh, give them a band on the hand, you know, these wristbands so that in case they have walked out, they can be found with all the addresses. You also give them what we have caregiver support. So they have a support group that they can go and went out and talk and exchange with the other people. So the caregiver is taken care of. And of course, like I explained earlier, the physical environmental changes within our home. Now we have to see how big or small the home is. But if they have all these skills and they are empowered what this information is, they know which steps and what is to be done with the person that they're taking care of in the home. And they know all the resources, what is available, where is the daycare, where is the doctor, where is what available for them. And thereby we empower the caregiver and take care of the caregiver. Tell them that they are not alone. There are a lot of people who are there to take care of them. Teach them how to give others. Delegate tasks to the children, to the family. Don't take everything on yourself. You have to look after yourself as well. I can go on and on. Moving, I'll stop. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, moving on to uh, Vidya, ma'am, can you share with us uh, one or two, you know, experiences, very positive experiences that people have come and told you with regard to home-based care of dementia? You'll have to unmute you. The thing is, uh, Vidya, that um, we always love to hear positive things. And we've been blessed to hear positive things from our family. So um, one of the things is that, you know, the first when we opened the center, within a matter of three weeks, we had two members till then. Within a matter of three weeks, this lady strayed from her house at seven in the morning and her, we got a call from the daughter-in-law saying that she's missing. So I said, don't panic. Mama has got used to coming to the center. Just go and see if she's there. So her husband went on one bike. The, um, the son went on another bike, different uh, directions. Guess what? Mama was waiting at the center. She was sitting on the stairs and just saying that baby is not well. She's not come. So she, I had to go in the morning. She requested, can you? I said, definitely I'll come. And I said, Mama, I need rest. No? And she was our first... Uh, person who came, family member living with dementia, and uh, she came from the parish of uh, uh, the other Portuguese church. And after that, of course, uh, I think six weeks later, one of the doctors walked, uh, a doctor's husband walked from Shivaji Park Street. So that's the time I decided, I said, no, they're happy, let's make it a six day week. But I told them, please don't make it seven, they need breaks also. So that was one positive aspect. The second is we got a lot of feedback, positive feedback from physicians or neurologists who had recommended them to us, they found a lot of change in their social behavior. They were withdrawn earlier and they were actually asking the doctor uh, questions back and conversing. So I thought, you know, we were on the right path and uh, word of mouth, we never had any advertising to be done and they all found it as a home. So we started with two caregivers and now we have seven. So I'm sure we are doing well and almost like a one-to-one, -one, very, very, we work like a family, you know? So like I tell people, I've got seven daughters, all gain, no pain. So that's how we work. And I think the 
home atmosphere, if you give it to them, nothing can stop you from growing as an individual because more than we doing something for them, it's they who are making us evolved. We're getting more patient, we're uh, empathizing more, we're getting more compassionate. And you know, they have their positive moments also, you know? So somebody will say something and they'll say, oh, you've forgotten your poetry, wait, this is a thing. That is absolutely wrong anyways. So we start clapping for the person who tried and the person who has corrected the teacher kind of, you know, is uh, giving their acknowledgement. So it's a person to person one and two is give your heart out. You don't have to pay. Non-verbal, uh, non-verbal expression, a hug, a tap on the shoulder, just a little, uh, you know, uh, uh, scratching on the head. What you would do for a small child. So, uh, that's our positive experience and uh, I'm very happy. I'm just waiting for the center to open as much as they are waiting for the center to open. So that, these are the positive, some of the positive things that have come out. Right, right. Th thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Before we have our last round of questions, I will just go back to Dr. Mala and I have a very small question to you and it's an area that you work in. I mean, you are known internationally as an expert in elder abuse. So my, my only one very small question to you is very often in home-based care of dementia patients, we may have caregivers, you know, who are looking after, who are hired caregivers, who are looking after the elderly. So, you know, could you just tell us maybe a few signs of, you know, elder abuse that relatives should be aware of to know, you know, that their caregivers are not being troubled. Ma'am, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you, Abhinash. Yeah, you see... I think uh, we need to be careful in terms of the fact that very often the caregiver kind of takes a position of authority because they sort of feel that they have been employed because they know it all and they are there to take care and they misuse this authority by not taking the interest of the patient in mind, but more their own interest in terms of what suits them better, uh, how to deal with an issue, how, to, uh, how much time to spend with the patient and so forth. And uh, while as a caregiver, they should always be engaged with the dementia patient, uh, they very often, uh, uh, are not very uh, polite to them. They are very often not very uh, accommodating uh, to the needs of them. They lose their uh, uh, patience or they show uh, no concern for their feelings. So that becomes a little uh, uh, issue which um, uh, uh, leads to elder abuse in uh, many situations. And what also uh, we must understand is that as a caregiver, they must be sensitive to the changes which are taking place in a person affected with dementia. Because gradual progression is always taking place. There are change in the symptoms, there are change in behavioral uh, reactions, and uh, a lot of unpredictable behavior happens. And the caregiver should not have a very rigid approach uh, to caring. And that way, uh, abuse can set in if the, there, uh, the caregiver is not very sensitive to the needs of the dementia patients. And I think uh, an important aspect is uh, that uh, uh, a caregiver should not encourage the family or uh, the, uh, the dementia patient uh, to overlook certain aspects by, as I said, taking a position of authority and saying, I know it all and you don't know anything uh, kind of attitude. So we see in many places this kind of abuse coming and it is not just happening in home care circumstances, it is also happening in institutional settings because they feel that how will a person with dementia complain? How will families who are so dependent on a care complain? 
So they take liberties with this kind of thing. And uh, that is not a very good sign of uh, caring for dementia patients. Thank you. Yeah, I'm now going to the the last round of you know very questions because we're coming to the last five minutes of our panel. So very quickly, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Prem, you know, your one or two points of advice towards home-based care. Okay, uh, I think the most important things in home-based care is one is make sure that the environment that you are setting it at home is ready when the home-based care is about to start, whatever the level is, whether it's going to be an intensive care, whether it's going to be just a supportive care, but it has to be ready. Uh, and as a person who wants to get into uh, home-based care, make sure that you've already contacted the needs, especially the organizations and everything is already set. Now, the reason being, it's, it's something which is a transition, so you need to be sort of ready for it. Secondly, do not exactly expect it to be like hospital it's not going to be that way the reason it's not going to be that way is because it's home and at the same time do not make sure that the other things are taken care of don't only think that what has happened to the older adult make sure that your team at home is also ready for it because sometimes you just say that we okay fine there's no problem we'll take care of people at home but as people will vouch, as uh, Dr. Smithal also vouch, is it's not it's easier said than done. You have to be ready. But at the same time, keep it a learning curve. I think one experience uh, and try to get experiences from others. Your experience will teach you the best. But keep it a learning curve and communication with whoever getting the home care is very, very important. The way you communicate to the person, I think, will help you in providing the best possibility. Right. Uh, Smita, ma'am, uh, your uh, last words. Yeah, I think, um, I think, you know, giving good, loving home care to people with dementia is, I think, a matter of teamwork. And I think all the family members need to support each other, not pressure each other. Uh, this is a new thing that each one of us would be facing, uh, no matter how much even you might have dealt with it professionally. So I think it's, you know, that teamwork is really important and a lot of support to the primary caregiver, who's usually the spouse. And third, I think each of the family members needs to indulge in, you know, a given amount of self care. If we are able to do that, we should be able to look after our family member in a very, very good way. All right. Well, um, um, Odette, ma'am, your final words as an occupational therapist and, you know, for caregivers. Um, just a small thing. Alone, we can do so little. But together, we can do so much. So everybody should know that, yes, you're not alone in all this. There's a whole team, a group of people, and you just need to have the resources at your fingertips so that you can reach out to whoever is there and who can guide you and help you depending on what your needs are. As an, as an OT, we are always ready to keep things ready. Guys. Keep the home ready before the patient comes home in so many ways. Right. Um, Mala, madam, uh, any final thoughts? One sentence, yeah, two sentences. I'll just yeah. brief, uh, sorry. Yeah, I would just uh, briefly like to say that uh, I think it is very important that as people concerned with dementia care, we try to advocate for strengthening dementia home care. And what I mean by that is we must have adequate training programs not only for family caregivers, but also for professional paid caregivers so that there are proper standards of care which are maintained. And I think we need to have some kind of accountability from a right-based approach. Uh, we at present don't think of dementia patients as somebody 
uh, who is uh, thinking, who is feeling, who is there, except for those who are working like uh, Vidya and uh, you, Avinash and few, but most generally people's conception is, uh, perception is uh, that you can do anything with a dementia patient. They've lost their memory. They don't know what is happening. So you do what you want. We have to treat them as persons. We have to treat them as people with feelings. And I think home care, which can give this personalized environment, can bring in more social interactions, can engage the dementia affected person in day-to-day uh, -day activities productively uh, becomes very important. And for that, a proper training for caregivers is a must in our country, uh, both for professional caregivers and for uh, family caregivers. We need more courses, we need more NGOs reaching out on this, and we must uh, make it, uh, and in terms of in-home care services, we must make them more affordable and easily accessible to people across the regions and uh, urban rural divide should not be there. Thank you. Right. Well, um... Uh, Vidya, ma'am, I mean, as on behalf of Smriti Vishwam, ARDSI, and, uh, you know, what would be your final takeaway before we end the panel? Yeah. I would just suggest we become dementia friendly, whether home or outside. Remember that the person with dementia is still the person that was, but cannot express. Let us believe that they are more alive inside emotionally than what, you know, reports say. And even if they can't recognize us, we can recognize them. And our tagline, remember those who cannot remember. Right, right. Well, uh, thank you so much. A big thank you to our entire panel, Dr. Prem, Dr. Odette, Dr. Smita Desai, Madam Mala Kapoor, and Vidya Shanoi, ma'am, for being here. I think the Bombay Psychiatric Society has benefited immensely by your presence and i think it's i mean we've had a non-psychiatric panel which is what we wanted and i think we we've sort of you all have all delivered i think this whole hope of home care which i think we've been advocating as clinicians but i think coming from you all it will have far more weightage uh, thank you very much for being here we've had over 50 people in the audience so i think with so many webinars happening i mean it definitely shows that there's an interest in this area and we also have the recording of this put up on youtube i will send it to you all personally on whatsapp or by email so uh, you all can put it up on your respective websites or wherever you would want so with that i mean i would want to thank you for today evening uh, i wish you all of course uh, september is dementia awareness month uh, we've already had yesterday was dementia awareness world alzheimer's day so uh, may we go forward and, you know, look forward to taking dementia care in India ahead. Uh, thank you. Good evening and God bless.